the church. I'm glad you made it, and I'm glad you sprung forward. I was wondering why I was tired this morning. I just want to thank God for iPhones that update the time. Because I woke up, I looked at the time, and I thought, why am I still tired? And uh, brilliant. So today we're talking about, again, life-changing stories. And, and, and I, I don't think I can emphasize enough. I, I showed you through the weeks how parables have been used to change lives throughout the history uh, of time, in a sense. It's amazing. They began so long ago. And it's because they're such an efficient way of transforming hearts. And I think today's is no different. Today's is, I'm going to show you how, how parables have been used thematically. Because it's interesting when you break all the parables of Scripture down, they'll fall into these themes or they'll fall into these groupings. And a lot of people, um, first of all, a lot of people just aren't used to parables. But second of all, they're not used to sort of how they transform your life. And so I'm hoping as we go through this that you personally are growing and you personally are learning more about the heart of Christ. Uh, this, this is no different today. This is fascinating, you know. I want to I want to take a quick glimpse back into history first. I want to I want to take you to a place where parables were used foundationally. And Solomon really used them in the wisdom parables. Um, he took proverbs and he threw parables into it. it. It's mixed in proverbs throughout. It's interesting. Um, and, and in those Proverbs that were more parabolic, he would teach things that are very practical. And so this theme we're going to talk about today, which is consistent even into the New Testament, which is where we're going to land, is, is really incredible to look at. And it's almost like I was never taught this, and I don't know of many Christians who are, by the way. It's like, how do you raise your children? I've been toying with actually breaking this down and giving you helpful advice because let me give you an example of what Solomon did. When he took this, he gave a verse like, by wisdom a house is built and through understanding it's established. And really what he's talking about within this is that apply wisdom rightly and you will build a solid house. Wisdom is when you take both the understanding of how you know something works and the knowledge you know of that, you combine it in a right way of thinking. When you do the right thing, it's called righteousness and it's called wisdom. When you apply what you know and understand in a godly fashion, you are a wise person. But if you take what you know and you understand and you pervert it or you do something bad with it, you're called wicked. This is the, the wrong way of doing it. These are the ungodly. And so what Solomon is saying, listen, if you take what you know, wisdom, and you build your house on it literally, and you understand how to establish it, if you know how to build a house, now, the big difference between Solomon and us today in building homes is that no, most of us in this room will never actually build our own home. I was privileged to build a house once, and it was very interesting. I found out what I would never like to do again in my life, and then I found some things I thought were really incredible. But one of the main things is that when you build a house, you better make sure that foundation is laid really well. And you've got to have people who understand how to lay the foundation well. You have to have wisdom. If you rush into certain things, it's foolish. So Solomon, even in the Old Testament, as he taught these things, and he taught us about building upon a good foundation, he said some very practical self. He said, you need to apply wisdom rightly in very practical daily things. In fact, so much so, he expands on it to say this. Put your outdoor work in order and get your fields ready. So after that, build your house. Let me give you a modern version of this. Organize your time, your work, your money, and prepare yourself before you go out and get a mortgage. You see the practicality of a proverb. He's basic, back then they had to build their homes, and nowadays uh, what I'm saying is we go out and we get a mortgage. So prepare your money. Prepare your time management. Do your work well. Consider the cost. Count the cost before you build the tower. Just some very practical advice. All of it around sort of the metaphor and the parable of building. So when I went into the New Testament, I looked at the, sort of the life of Christ and I looked at the parables, something fascinating stuck out in my mind. Twice Jesus, in a very short amount of time, gave an incredible message. 
One of those messages was called the Sermon on the Mount. It's probably the most uh, famous message of Christ. And it was done outside. It was on the North Shore of Galilee. I've actually been there. It's, it's sort of like uh, this coastal area where it has a slow rising hill. And there's actually a chapel on top of that hill now. But what happened is you could see where Jesus being surrounded by thousands of people could easily sort of speak to them. It had lots of room to spread out. So the first one's the Sermon on the Mount. The second one is actually lesser known, but just as powerful, called the Sermon on the Plain. Some say these are the same, but most would say they probably occurred within the same period, but they were at a different time. What's fascinating about both of these messages, which are the most powerful messages ever written in Scripture, what's fascinating is they both end with a foundational parable. When you conclude something, usually you want to conclude with a bang, right? You want to go out and say, I want people to remember this. I want them to capture their hearts. I want them to seriously consider this. I want them to take something home. I want them to remember something. In both of these scenarios, it's the same parable, but it's tweaked differently. Jesus says the same thing at the conclusion of it. Now, the Sermon on the Mount is fascinating because in the Sermon on the Mount, the best way I've put it is, if you want to know what a follower of Jesus looks like, you look at the Sermon on the Mount and look at what he preached in that message. He preached the picture-perfect follower of Jesus Christ. He preached, this is how a Christian acts. This is what a Christian does. This is what a Christian thinks. This is what a Christian desires. This is how Christians should be. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Over and over and over again. It's fascinating because he teaches us the value of love. He teaches us the value of people and loving people. He teaches us the value of our sexuality. He teaches us the value of integrity. And he teaches us the value of self-respect. All in the Sermon on the Mount, he rolls this out. He teaches the Lord's Prayer. He teaches, blessed are those. He goes through uh, the conditions of the heart. And then at the very end, he throws this parable in to close the message. He says, therefore. Therefore, in Matthew 7, 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain, it came down, the streams, they rose, and the winds, they blew, and they beat against the house. Yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on a rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down. The streams rose, the winds blew, and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Which means when he got to this parable and he said this, he said, if you don't practice the Sermon on the Mount, your life will crash. And he said it authoritatively. That confronts our heart. If you don't take serious what I've just said to you, what I have poured out to you in truth and spirit and in love and in everything, your life will crash. You'll look just like the next person. Your house will look the same. Notice in the parable, both homes will look the same. The difference is what they're built on. And how do you know if it's built on something good or bad? Whether they're Christian or not. How do you even know? When the rain hits. When life hits you. He promises you in life you're going to get hit by a storm. Unequivocally, you're going to get hit by a storm. You're going to get hit by rain. You're going to get hit. The question is not whether the storms will come. The question is, what did you build your house on? What I love about Benicia is that we, we're built on a pretty heavy rock here. So when earthquakes hit, or we're used to earthquakes, those gentle rolling things, most of us don't even wake up for, by the way, um, 
but those earthquakes, and we're built on this rock in Benicia, and it's amazing how much the earthquake kind of goes around us. But I was in the Northridge one, and it was like, wow, when God moves the planet, he knows how to get your attention. And I sat there, and I thought, you know, what was interesting is you could tell when the Northridge earthquake hit, you could tell how it affected the foundation. You could literally, the, God's truth, this is crazy. Like, one side of the street, the homes would be totaled. Red tagged. Other side of the street, they'd be totally fine. I saw one building. It was fascinating to me. If you were to look at these two buildings, they were next to each other. One was red tagged, and it was a business building. It was like three, four stories. Each one of them. One was red tagged. The other one was green. And I looked at the red tagged one, and I couldn't tell anything. It looked just like the other one. Until you looked at the foundation. The foundation, because the earthquake had been offset by six inches. The whole building had just been moved. And in this particular parable, what's interesting to me is there's this idea that um, rain and storms, it's the idea of over lifetime. It's not the idea of just like one storm. It's like when the rains hit, when the floods come, when the winds blow. It's like, it's not just one thing. In fact, in life, what I've noticed for a lot of people, it's not one thing that tears down the house. It's, it's the little things. It's a lot of things. It's the constant dripping. And so Jesus is sitting in here. He says, you know, you're wise if you practice these things because these things are a foundation for living your life. Did you learn math? How important was that? I'll tell you what, this is more important. Why? This, practically speaking, prepares you for life. So that when the rain hits and the winds blow and all the stuff hits you, you'll be okay. In fact, he says, therefore, because of all these things, because of all these truths I've taught you that you can practice, you're going to be solid because you're built on a rock. And when you're built on a rock, you don't even realize it at first. And then all of a sudden the rain hits and all of a sudden your house is good. You know, when we first bought our home and we moved into our home, I was really curious through the first winter how our house would do. Because if there were any leaks or any problems, what would happen? They'd show up in the storm. I would find out in the storm what was going on. And Jesus is saying, if you build your house on the rock, I promise you, nothing in this lifetime will tear you down. But he refers back. In fact, one of the truths that I love that he speaks to in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, don't judge. He's not saying there shouldn't be judges, there shouldn't be right and wrong, there shouldn't be justice. He's saying don't judge in a pers pers personal criticism of people or you too will be judged. You see, in the same way you judge others, you'll be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And so one of the things you learn in living your life is that whatever that measurement is you have in your life, it's going to get used back on you if you're not careful. So if you live by the law and a bunch of to-dos and lists of getting these things done and the busy rush, rush, rush and all this other stuff, then that's the measure he'll give to you and you will fall. Unless, of course, you live by a different measuring stick that loves unconditionally, that shows self-respect, that shows integrity, that shows a, a, a respect for your sexuality, for other people, for loving people. What do we practice and what do we preach? What do we teach our children? What is most important in life? You see what Jesus is saying here? He's saying these are the foundations of your life, not what the Pharisees and Sadducees have perverted as the truth, not what the Romans teach you in the hedonism of the day, and not what your wealth can bring you. Because no matter how nice the house looks, if it doesn't have a good foundation, it will fall. I don't know. I like YouTube a little bit because you could go on there and fix anything with YouTube. But there's also this thing I was watching the other day where they go into abandoned houses and they show you abandoned houses. They went into this mansion. Uh, it was in England. And what's fascinating about that is that this mansion literally, we're talking like a $40 million home that had been let go. 
And now the roof was caving in, the indoor swimming pool, the gardens. You see where I'm going with this? It doesn't matter how big or nice your home looks. When the rains hit, the foundation reveals itself. And sand is interesting because sand is more the slow sinking idea, right? Sand isn't like the, uh, the instant crash. Sand's like the slow sinking. And Jesus is saying, listen, these things I spoke to you in the Sermon on the Mount about, I advise you to read it again and again until you know what's the practice, what's the thing you should do. If you read the Sermon on the Mount and you don't instantly say to yourself, what should I practice? Not what should I know, what should I do? Because it's the fool who says, what should I know without knowing what to do with what they know. You'll never build your house right. You, you have to know it and understand it and apply righteousness to it and then you'll be wise. So, so that's the condition we live in. We live in a condition where everybody wants to know, but nobody wants to do. The parable. The parable. Two foundations. Guys, I want you to live a life that is full and rich and confident and secure, regardless of what swims around in culture. And what's really cool about what Jesus just said here is, you notice what he said here? He said, it doesn't, your life is not determined by the virus of the week. Your life is not determined by the political class system. Your life is not determined by the amount of money in your pocketbook. Your life is not determined by these things. And I sit there and I say unequivocally, amen, hallelujah, and thank you, Jesus, for giving me a new way of living. But I need to know the way to live, and I need to live it. So this particular conclusion to his, his uh, Sermon on the Mount, to me, is very powerful. And, and notice that obviously it affected the people, because what's it say at the very end? It says that they basically were in awe. Like, how do I take that? They were stunned. They weren't scared. They, weren't, they were just stunned. They were like in awe. Like, this guy's not just preaching to us. He's telling us. The truth. He's not asking us to consider the truth and have an argument and debate the truth. He's standing up and basically saying, I am the truth, and this is the truth, and you need to do the truth. He speaks as one having authority, not as one who is insecure and doesn't know what to say or do in their life. But our culture swims with that mentality of, oh, your truth is your truth, my truth is my truth, whatever truth you want, grab onto it, enjoy it, as long as you're happy. And Jesus wasn't there. That wasn't the truth he was preaching, you know? And people say, Jesus wants you to be happy. Jesus wants you to follow in his footsteps. Dude, his footsteps where he had great days and he had miserable days. But no matter what his day looked like, he had an incredible peace and contentment and joy and perfection to it. Even in the cross, he took it with perfection. He teaches us how to live on good days, bad days, rough days, uh, sad moments, happy moments, all moments of life. Because you see, truth, his truth, was meant to help you through the tensions and the uncertainties of this world. His truths were here to help you go through the sins and the muck and the mire of the things we deal with in this world. But you're never going to understand that unless you practice it. Never. And practicing it is the hardest thing. You know, most Christians don't have a disciplined day of rest. They don't have a disciplined way of even fasting and praying when they're going through very hard times. They don't have disciplines of devotion. And then they wonder when things kind of mm, go sideways, why they're so insecure and why, and then they scream out to God, why are you not here? And he's sitting there going, dude, you just showed up out of nowhere. And when Jesus was preaching this, he was preaching it to people who sincerely wanted to follow. He was preaching it to incredible hypocrites. He was teaching it to a religious class, a poor class, and God knows who else was there. But, but I'll tell you what, when he was done, it was really clear what he meant. Do you take your faith as the foundation of the way you live your life? And would you know what that means?
if I asked you? The rock that is higher than I. So he says this twice. His parable is used twice. The Sermon on the Plain has many of the same similarities, by the way, as the Sermon on the Mount. That's why they confuse and think maybe they're the same. But it's also interesting because it does vary slightly. It has a different emphasis. And the story itself is different a little bit. And so what happens in the Sermon on the Plain, listen to what he says. Who do you call me? Lord, Lord. Why do you call me? I'm sorry. Why do you call me? Lord, Lord. And you do not do what I say. I, I feel like that as a parent sometimes. Why do you call me your dad if you're not going to do what I say? Right? When you have little kids and they don't do what you say. And you're like, wow. You love me, daddy, daddy. But it's like, come on, help me out here. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and you do not do what I say? As for everyone who comes to me and hears my words and puts them into practice, I'll show you what they're like. They're like a man building a house who dug down deep and he laid the foundation on rock. And when a flood came, the torrent struck that house but could not shake it because it was well built. But the one who hears my words and does not put them into practice, that is like a man who built a house on the ground, without a foundation. The moment the torrent struck that house, it collapsed, and its destruction was complete. This is interesting. Because here you see a little more of the effort that we need to put into this. You see a little more of the digging to the rock. You see a little more of the creating the foundation. In fact, in this section, he's speaking of a new inner disposition that has to occur. There's a new heart that you need to have. Because when Jesus said, I want to get down to it to put my rock, he wasn't talking about a physical home here, right? This is a parable. What was he talking about? You see, you could take two people who claim to be Christian and stand them up side by side and they both look whatever, dapper, whatever your view would be of Christianity. And you say, oh, those are two great people. But each in the heart may be totally different. What Jesus is getting at in the conclusion of this message is he's saying that this is a heart foundation. That's where Jesus builds his work. It's not enough to say, this is the way I look on the outside. It's not enough even to say, I will do something good, because both of those people could be highly charitable. But they could still have the wrong motivation of what? The heart. This one's challenging to me even, guys. Because let me, let me phrase it a different way. When you follow Jesus with your heart, you want to do what Jesus wants to be, have done. You want Jesus' work to be done in other people's lives as well as your own. One of the ways you could tell is when's the last time you did something you didn't want to do because Jesus wanted you to do it? When's the last time you did something you didn't want to do but Jesus wanted you to do it? You feel it, don't you? You feel it. I'm married, man. When my wife wants me to go to like a thrift shop or a 50% off thing, I feel it. I feel it like I love you and I'm trying to work this whole new model. I love you and because you love that, I'll love you and go there with that, I guess. But it is unconditional love, is it not? In the simplest things as well as the most complex. But this idea of he wants to get to the heart, it's like, he doesn't want me just to drag along with my wife and go where she wants. He wants me to go there with a good heart and attitude. I got to get my heart right. Do you think it's any different when Jesus tells you to love unconditionally somebody that you really just don't even like? How many weird, obscure people do you have in your life? 
And weird is really relevant to who you are, by the way. <laughs> I mean, everybody's weird is a little different. In fact, I looked up the word weird once, and I love the definition. It means fascinatingly different. And you know what? Some people are more fascinating than others. But we love everybody, right? Really? When did you let that everybody come into your life? Rich, poor, down and outers, up and outers. What, 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 what does that mean, if not practice? You need an inner disposition that comes from the heart that is Jesus. In every one of the Sermon on the Mount and even in the Sermon on the Plain, he speaks to the heart. And he basically says, yeah, you sit here and say, yeah, I've never committed adultery, but you do it in your heart all the time. You're stuck on porn even though you haven't cheated on your wife. You've got to work on this, guys. The disposition of the heart is what Jesus gets to. And I find the heart foundation is hard work because sometimes I don't even know my own heart. Have you ever noticed that? The tension of your own heart. Like, what do you really want? Some people, it's like when you're younger, you just want to get that partner in your life or that person. And, you, and in some ways, this culture and, you know, it's scary. So some part of the culture says you shouldn't ever marry because, you know, somebody will let you down. So just live with them and be happy and feed yourself or whatever. And then the other part says, no, you should marry and be committed, but then they make it all about that other person in your life. What if there isn't another person in your life? What if God just wants you as you are for the rest of your life? Man, that's a hard tension when you're 19, 20, 21, right? In your 20s and you're looking for that. Thinking, thinking the relationship is really going to satisfy everything in your life. When in reality, Jesus said, when did I ever say that? I gave you marriage as a blessing for the sake of both of you in companionship, but I didn't tell you it would answer everything in your life. I'm that answer in your life. I'm the rock. You need to dig deeper into your heart and say, why are you even looking for that? I'm the rock. He's the heart foundation. One of the ways he shows this in this sermon on the plain is right before he even speaks this, he says this, no good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick up figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. A good man brings good things out of the goods stored up in his heart. An evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of. I find many Christians don't even believe this. And why do I say that? Because whenever somebody opens their mouth and says something they shouldn't, the Christian next to him says, oh, they didn't mean it. Where's that in the Bible? No, when you make a stupid thing out of your mouth, you meant it. The issue now is you need forgiveness. But since we don't practice that one either, you see, there's a process. There's a practice to our faith. I'll blow it. I'll say something I shouldn't say someday to you, maybe. And I would hope, by God's grace, if it's sinful, that I would ask your forgiveness. And I would hope, if it was just unfounded and non-malicious, that you would be able to forgive. But the reality is you can't practice forgiveness unless you accept what comes out of your mouth. It's from your heart. I've had bad days where I wake up and I say something short to my wife and so I disrespect her or I'm inconsiderate of her. And I say, babe, will you forgive me? I was inconsiderate. I totally disrespected you. I'm not going to justify that, that that didn't, you know, oh, that was an accident. I'm so sorry. Sorry. That was a condition of the heart. You need to be walking in the spirit this morning, not in the flesh. But see, that's if you practice Christianity. You notice what he says. A good man brings good things out of the good that's stored up. So there's got to be something good in your heart and in your head. There must be truth in there. You got anything in there to store up? And then it comes out of where? The heart. We're not just putting bags together for the homeless so that people can feel good about themselves. 
We're putting get bags together for the homeless because Jesus loves them. And we need to get used to loving them too. He loves people, all his people. He doesn't ignore the poor or the rich. He doesn't ignore the realities of the conditions. And what he's saying here is, guys, a good person does good from a good heart. That's where the rock should be in your heart. Because you could be doing a good thing and look just like the next person next to you doing the same good thing, but your motivation of the heart is utterly corrupt. Because it's all about feeling good about who? Yourself. I would rather have the guy over here that's doing the exact same thing, but in his heart he's wrestling with God saying, I don't want to do this, Jesus. I know you want me to, but I, I had no desire to take two hours out of my day to do this. I would rather have that wrestling in the heart that finally becomes obedient to the love of Jesus and says, Jesus, because you love them, I want to love them. Teach me to love them. I would rather that motivation than the one that says, look at how good I am and what I can do for those who are hurting. And when Jesus preached these messages, guys, if you listen to what he's saying, he's not speaking to their actions as much as he's speaking to their hearts and their motivations. And this is the thing that gets me out of everything that Jesus did. He knew our motivations were corrupt. Fascinating. But notice both of these uh, parables, really interesting. In this parable, there's no foundation at all in the other house. So something hits and the destruction is complete. What does that mean? It means you totally destroyed your life. And to the other person, what does it mean? It means you are totally going to make it through everything in life. And he says these things, and wow. I mean, what are you going to do when you hear somebody preach like this? Both of these parables, the person is building or digging down to what? The rock. The rock, this immovable granite that no storm of life, no suffering of life, no pains of life, no circumstances of life will ever move you because you will be built on that rock. And unequivocally, every commentary writer will say, no one can lay any foundation other than one already laid, which is Jesus Christ, the rock. So what is Jesus saying in these parables? What's he saying in these messages? He's saying, I don't want to get into your head. I don't want to get into your practice. I want to get into your heart, and then I want you to practice. I want, I want to get into your heart, and then I want to get into your head. I want to get into your heart because I know really it's out of your desires. What do you really want today? Right? What do you want? Do you want to sit there and give your love to Jesus and say, you know what, Jesus, here's my plans for the day, but I just want to ask you a question. What do you want me to do? If I have to scrap everything I had planned for the day, and you want me to do something I'm uncomfortable doing, I'll do it. I'll do it. I may not even like it at first. But it's not motivated out of like. It's motivated out of love. Wow. Wow. It's an inner disposition he's working on here, guys. You see, he's saying you've got to build your life on the foundation of Jesus. I'm not saying build your life on the foundation of Kelly unless I say build your life on the foundation of the spirit that's in Kelly. Because the spirit of God that's in me, I would tell you right now, will put you through any storm. Any storm. We've been attacked. I've felt the rain. I've felt the floods. And I felt the wind. And you could talk to my wife. We're good. We're more than good. We're downright durable. It isn't that things won't hit you in life. It's not even that things won't be hard. In fact, it assumes there will be hard things. It is to say, will you live this life for me or for yourself? What's the motivation of your heart? Will you listen to the messages that I've given you? And will you practice them? Or will you just say, those sound so cool. Those are nice words. 
Blessed are the poor in spirit. I just like the sound of it. Hmm. You ever try to be poor in spirit? Has God ever humbled you? Poor in your mind. I love this section, both of these sections. I couldn't end without one section. I got to share this. Uh, they're filled with the ways we live. But look at the way Christians live. I love this one in particular. It's found in the Luke passage. He says, but to you who are listening, I say. If you're listening, if you still are awake in this service right now and you're listening, listen to what he says. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you if someone slaps you on one cheek turn to them the other also if someone takes your coat don't withhold your shirt from them give to everyone who asks you and if anyone takes what belongs to you do not demand it back do to others as you would have them do to you the golden rule is a rule practiced and not just thought of Who is it on social media you just hate? Who is it in your life that you're just uncomfortable around? Do you have any enemies? I go in and out of having enemies personally, by the way. Depends on what they think of me. I could get in a group of eight people and all I have to do is say I'm a pastor and four will love me and four will hate me. Guess what? I love all of them. But you're only going to have this kind of an attitude to change your life if you built your life on a rock. A rock. Immovable. What's your life been like? You can measure whether Jesus is the rock of your life by the measurement of your life. At least if you're my age or if you're in your 30s. or Maybe when you're 18, you're growing and learning these things. Great. Apply these. Apply these so that you can look back when you're 40 and say, wow. Thank you, Jesus, you've been my rock. Because that's what I'm going to say. But look at your life. Look at the storms that have hit you and ask yourself a very simple question. What did I build on? What did I allow to hit me? And maybe my last little encouraging word is maybe go back and read these sermons and make little marginal notes that say, here's what I should do. 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 And practice them. Christianity not practiced is not Christianity. I love Christianity. I love being a Christian. And so when I think of what's going on in our culture and the anxieties of what's going on, the difficulties... I don't try to minimize those. We don't know what to make of this stuff that's going around. We don't know what to make of a lot of things, but he does. I'm not insecure by it because I know there's a foundation I can build on that is a rock in this life and the life to come. And he has carried us this far, and my son will be here second service. I will not be scared to love others because of this. Right? But I will be discretionary. It warrants concern. It warrants compassion. It warrants loving others even more. Whether that's a fist bump or an encouraging word. But folks, when you build your house, build it wisely and it will stand the test of time and life. Build it on Jesus. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much uh, Jesus, thank you, for, thank you for preaching with clarity. That, that you weren't, you're not a God of fuzziness. You don't, you don't speak into our lives with, you're not sure. This world uh, sends us mixed messages all the time. Jesus, thank you for giving us truth. And not just truth that mentally is solid, but truth that really can transform our lives. And give us a better life. And give us a life that truly is lived out of joy and grace and compassion. 
Thank you so much for your forgiveness and your love for us, Jesus. Because, Jesus, you not only spoke this message in truth and love, you lived it in life, death, and life again. For yours is the resurrection and the life. And you, you are our rock. And we will praise and worship you this morning because that is who you are and that is what we should do. In your name, amen. Please stand as we sing.